1969, the year humans first set foot on the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. People around the world were riveted by this history-making footage. Thirty years later, work began on the International Space Station. A massive cooperative project involving 15 nations. It made long-term space habitation possible. So far, six Japanese astronauts have served aboard the ISS. Four of them completed extended missions longer than four months. Now a number of plans have been proposed to open space travel up to ordinary people, not just highly trained astronauts. Space vacations may be a reality in the near future. What is it like to fly into space? What does it take to live in space? Today, a Japanese astronaut talks about the new era in space travel. Welcome to Science View. I'm your navigator, Rene Yamada. Science View covers the latest advances in Japanese science and technology. This week, I'm excited to welcome to the show a very well-known figure in Japan and our new science watcher, astronaut Naoko Yamazaki. Hello, I'm happy to be here. This is my first time as a TV presenter, so I'm a little nervous. But I'm looking forward to sharing the fascination of space and my experience there with all of you. Let's take a look at some highlights of Naoko Yamazaki's impressive career. Naoko Yamazaki was selected to become an astronaut in 1999. <laughs> In April 2010, she went into orbit aboard the Space Shuttle Discovery. Booster ignition and liftoff of Discovery. Her primary mission was to help assemble the International Space Station. She operated the shuttle and ISS robotic arms in her role as loadmaster. Aboard the ISS's Japanese experiment module, nicknamed Kibo, Yamazaki played a koto she had taken with her. After 15 days on the ISS, she returned to Earth. Thank you very much. Ms. Yamazaki is also a mother of two daughters. Yes. My second daughter was born after my 2010 mission. She is nine years younger than my first, so that presented a new challenge in parenting for me. And now for today's topic, life in space. We'll be seeing behind the scenes footage taken by NHK cameras during the final selection of Japanese astronauts in 2009, with insider insights from Ms. Yamazaki along the way. By examining the personal qualities required to be an astronaut, we'll explore what it takes to live in space. The final astronaut selection tests take place in this isolation chamber. It's an extreme environment just like the International Space Station, but recreated here on Earth. Behind the entrance hatch lies a working area of about 23 square meters. Then a 20 square meter eating area. And at the rear, sleeping stations squeezed into a cozy 63 square meters. The candidates are monitored 24 7. Just like the space station, there is no privacy. Bye. Bye. The final 10 candidates enter the chamber. They will be isolated in the sealed facility for the next week.
The astronaut selection process has long been shrouded in mystery. Now we lift the veil to reveal what it takes to be one of the chosen in Japan's space program. A selection panel observes the candidates' every move, every word, through monitors. The panel includes experts in psychology and ergonomics. And astronauts. Altogether, 40 experts in various fields work to identify who has what it takes to be an astronaut. The first prerequisite leadership. Who will have the qualities needed to lead astronauts from around the world? The chamber is stocked with building blocks and electrical equipment. The candidates are told to make a robot that is able to comfort people. They are given 12 hours over four days to complete the task. Split into teams of five, they set to work. Team two focuses on how to make the robot move using sensors and software. We could adjust the speed with an audio signal, a hand clap. It could measure distances using ultrasonic waves. If we use light, we can make it move in a straight line. Despite the limited time available, the team hasn't even begun to discuss construction specifics. I guess we can't do anything too fancy. Maybe we were being a bit too ambitious. The ideas were good. In this session, the selectors are particularly interested in pilot and successful candidate Kimiya Yui, wearing the letter G. If we can make the basic body structure in the first two hours, then work out the programming for about two hours, Yui isn't scheduled to act as team leader today, but that doesn't stop him from taking charge. Then, in about two hours, we can make a prototype of the robot we're aiming for. When discussions stall, G is the one that moves them forward. B is officially the leader, and he's doing his job. But when they hit a wall, it's G who sums things up and suggests what to do. Each of the ten candidates is an expert in his or her own field, but the panel gives its highest marks to Yui for his natural leadership abilities. That's interesting. I'm sure showing leadership is very important for astronauts, but would leadership be so important for regular people who are just going to space as tourists? Well, I do think it is important even for ordinary people going into space. In space, many of the conditions we take for granted on Earth don't apply, starting with the microgravity environment there. So a problem that would be trivial to deal with on Earth could develop into a critical issue affecting space flight operations. When something goes wrong, you need to come up with ways to deal with it and act right away. Everyone on board needs to have a leader's ability to do that. So a space tourist would need to have the initiative to assess and resolve situations on their own then. Is there a minimum level of space know-how that a regular person would need? Yes, absolutely. In an emergency, the first priority is to know and follow essential procedures. Before going to space, you have to master that. Anyone who wants to go into space needs to understand that leadership is not just about issuing orders. Leadership is also not blindly following orders, but pointing out possible errors and providing a cross-check. That's why leadership is such an important quality. 
and so is followership, knowing how to intelligently follow the leadership of others. So the first key term in today's Life in Space topic was leadership. Now let's look at how the final selection process for Japan's astronauts tested their stress tolerance levels. The space station is a cramped workplace with nowhere to escape. It is in this high stress environment that astronauts work day in, day out. There is no room for error. The candidate's ability to cope with this kind of stress is about to be tested. Origami paper, needles and thread are delivered to the candidates in their chamber. Their task is simple, make paper cranes. The candidates are given one hour a day over four days to fold 100 paper cranes. The test is designed to apply stress by forcing the candidates to focus on a delicate task over and over again. Would anyone slip up? A psychologist observes. For astronauts, even the most basic tasks can be critical. I look at whether they can keep on doing the same thing for a set time without getting fed up and at their ability to tolerate the inevitable fatigue that it causes. One candidate, pilot Takeshi Daisaku, makes an error early on. He tries to show off his individuality by mixing up the separate color piles of origami paper. But... No way! The written instructions state that the colors should be kept separate. He had completely overlooked the instruction. Daisaku rearranges the paper back into color groups, but he only manages six cranes by the end of the day and falls behind. So an ability to tolerate stress is important too. I imagine being in space in such cramped conditions would be quite stressful. How did you deal with it, Ms. Yamazaki? The ISS is about the size of a soccer field, but the living quarters don't take up much of that, so it was a little bit stressful. But in my case, I had to follow a minute-by-minute -minute schedule in order to complete my mission. So that was a bigger source of stress for me. I see. Besides the cramped quarters, what other sources of stress would there be for space tourists? I can think of several. First, let me use the ISS as an example. It's a completely artificial environment with absolutely no contact with the outdoors. The closest example is probably a hospital, but it's even more thorough. For example, the smells, sounds, and airflow Everything you have five senses take in is artificial. And there are only a few windows. Of course, when the sensations we take for granted on Earth are gone, that's bound to be stressful. Anything else? Well, one more is all that separates you from the vacuum of space and instant death. If anything goes wrong, it could be life-threatening. So there is always that anxiety. And even though there are backup sources for electricity, oxygen, and water, you still need to live on quite limited resources, minimizing waste. You also cannot blink many personal possessions from ours. None of these things would be very different, even for space tourists. So how did you relieve your stress, Ms. Yamazaki? I learned personal stress management techniques and put them into practice during my time on the ISS. One is a breathing technique called abdominal breathing that you can use any time. And another is a relaxation visualization technique for when you go to sleep. I found them really effective and still use them from time to time. Mm. Our second key term for living in space was stress tolerance. If you want to go into space someday, you will need to learn some stress relief exercises. Now we'll have an intermission with Ms. Yamazaki going back to the classroom. Let's watch the space classes she taught at an international school in Yokohama.
what happens to your body in space? Do you have any idea, imagination in microgravity environment? So in a microgravity, everybody is our Superman, right? <laughs> you get very powerful because everybody and everything floats. And our height changes as well. And my height gets taller by one inch. And usually everybody gains heights uh, by one to two, two inches. So do you know why? Mm. Yeah. Is that the gravity that strikes the spine or something? Exactly, yeah. The space between spines uh, get expanded due to microgravity. So if you go back to the Earth, you get back to the normal height. <laughs> so just only when you are in space, you get taller. So how did you think about weight? Weight should be changed, maybe, maybe not. Yeah. Um, I think it might decrease because when you're in space, mm -hmm. this muscle, as you're not working as hard mm -hmm. in a microgravity environment. Exactly, yes. Usually people lose this weight by 10% or 20%. But please imagine how you measure your weight in space. Remember, everything floats. So if you, you know, use a regular bathroom scales, it doesn't work, right? So that this is the scales in space. And inside this silver, uh, they put uh, big springs. And you measure the speed of the oscillation of the springs. Then you, have to, you can calculate the mass of these people. So that's how we measure weight in space. And as you mentioned, we use jewelry. Uh, loses our weight because uh, like this muscles and bone density so muscles uh, because we don't have to walk we just use hands to uh, translate so we lose the especially lower bodies muscles and because of that we lose the bone density about one to two percent every month and for the muscles we lose about one percent every uh, every day so it's quite a lot so to prevent that uh, we have to do exercise every day for two hours like this have you ever heard of moon phase our faces get rounded in space because the fluids, like a blood or the fluids, uh, shift to upper body because uh, there is no gravity. So in space, uh, people's face gets rounded, so we call it moon face, right? So due to that fluid shift, uh, our brains considers, oh, there are lots of fluids in our body. It's not that, it's just in you know, a fluid shift to upper body, but the brain considers there are more fluids in our body. So we try to uh, release our fluids by peeing, right, in, in the bathroom. So in space, our, the amount of fluids in the body actually gets decreased about, uh, not half, but 60, 70%. So in that condition uh, of our body, it kind of gets dried. So if we go back to the Earth in that condition, we feel very, very thirsty. And some people get unconscious when uh, you return to the Earth. So before going back to the Earth, we have to drink salted water about half gallons. So it's a kind of pity task. It's hard actually to drink, just drink uh, salted water in before just one hour before uh, going back to the Earth. So in space, our body changes like this. Uh, it's not just a joke, but it's, I think it's kind of based on uh, scientific data. <laughs> 
actually a body, a bigger face and a skinny, lower body and taller. <laughs> so, what happens to your tears in space when you cry? Oh, yeah. Actually, I cried once just before going back to the Earth because oh, I, you know, I wished I could stay longer in space, and uh, yeah. It, just regular, but the tear won't drop, just stays there. So the water bubble is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. <laughs> so it's kind of funny. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you can cry. I was wondering, is it difficult to fall asleep in space? Oh, good question. Well, uh, first night I felt very strange because even in a space uh, sleeping bag, our body floats, so I feel very, very uncertain because you know, just floating, just like a, uh, underwater. But the second night, the third night, uh, yeah, it, I guess I get used to it. So no worries. Yeah, we can sleep very well in space. Actually, you can have a dream in space as well. Cool. So just, yeah, <laughs> just the same. In your free time in space, how do you occupy yourself? Well, let's see. I have a couple of hours free time, and I took lots of pictures <laughs> from the window. And also, we, I exchanged emails with my friends and families, and what else? And of course, I look the arts. It's just beautiful, it's fascinating. So, you will never bored uh, seeing the arts, so you will enjoy it. They asked some good questions. It looked like they enjoyed your visit. It was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Children will be the space explorers of the future. Now, we return to Life in Space to see how JAXA tested its candidate's ability to lighten up the atmosphere. Becoming an astronaut requires another special skill. Astronauts live in the space station for extended periods of time with people of all different customs and cultures. Tensions can rise over even minor issues, so an astronaut must be able to handle communal living. <laughs> the candidates are given a new task, entertain your colleagues with a special talent. The candidates will all vote for their favorite act to choose a winner. By twisting his wrist, Ouch, that hurts! Showing off his Aikido moves is Maritime Self-Defense Force member Norishige Kanai. <laughs> Obstetrician and gynecologist Sachiko Ezawa sings songs in four different languages. <laughs> but ultimately, the winner is successful candidate and pilot Takuya Onishi. Up until now, Onishi has completed each test displaying a cool and steady approach. It's a one-man musical. <laughs> He's got something appealing about him. Oh. He's good on the reasoning and logic side, and he's strong in this area, too. Onishi successfully wins over the hearts of the other candidates. The selectors rate him highly not only for his calm demeanor, but also his ability to bring the team members together. That one-man musical performance was really something. 
Mizu Yamazaki, what did you do to lighten things up? I don't have any special talent, but I did take a traditional Japanese musical instrument to play about the ISS. In that artificial environment, the sound of live music can offer some rare warmth. Just a few minutes playing it can change your mood. Since people from all different countries and cultures are living together on board, having a way to convey something of your own culture can be a good icebreaker. Our third key term has been lightening up the atmosphere. It's important in space because it leads to better communication, but when does it really make a difference? It is important in all situations. A spacecraft is like the ultimate share house all the facilities and resources are communal. For example, if you don't clearly tell everyone exactly when you are going to use a toilet and for how long, it causes problems for others. You have to speak up about what you want to do and understand what other people are saying they want to do and act accordingly. Clear communication helps to get work done more efficiently. It makes spacecraft operations smoother. Also, lightening things up really helps to minimize friction on board. Mm -hmm. Many space flights are now being planned for non-astronauts. What preparations will they have to undergo before going to space? Getting prepared in terms of health and fitness, of course and they should undergo a simulation of the conditions in outer space. What to do in microgravity, how to deal with physical discomforts, and even planning the photos you want to take beforehand instead of after you get there, to make the best use of limited time. Of course, the environment is different in space from on the ground, and the unexpected can happen. But it makes a huge difference if you have completed a simulation. So what type of mindset do you need for life in space? Whether you are an astronaut or a space tourist, in space, everyone's fates are linked. It's important to understand that. In space, only a wall separates you from a deadly void. A single mishap could easily puncture that wall. So the situation is always precarious. You have to be very aware that you are all working together to keep the spacecraft operating to get everyone home safely. As we close, do you have any message to share with our viewers? Space may seem like an impossibly distant place, but humanity actually originated from space fragments. Space is our home. Traveling into space is a quest for our origins. I hope that everyone will join in this ambitious challenge to take the leap into space and make great discoveries there. Thank you so much, Mizu Yamazaki. See you again next time.